deal with greenhouse gas mitigation. And already 29 states and Puerto Rico have completed action plans here. So I wanted to show you those state-by-state state trends to show you in the next slide what we did at Toyota to make it a little concrete. And uh, um, I think the timing on this is working in the way that I want to cultivate questions after this Toyota example. If we can go to the next slide. Back in 1999, I was fortunate enough to be hired by the head of sales and marketing at Toyota, the head of law, and the head of the body shop. And they enabled my firm to put together a four-person team, uh, some auto design engineers from Denmark, some ex-executives. And from 99 to 2002, uh, we worked on the corporate strategy of the hybrid powertrain. So I want to tell you some of the lessons I learned from that. Now, we were not free to talk about that for five years. And that's why World Inc. is timed to come out last April, because of the confidentiality constraint. But what you need to know is that this storyline about pursuing product efficiency is totally an example of how change in the future on sustainable issues will come embedded in the product, not necessarily in the rules. So in 99, Toyota only had about 8.4% of the world market share, and GM had about 30.4% of the world market share. Today, Toyota has more than 10% of the world market share, so this is a story of classical business growth, and its market cap is more than the value of GM and Ford combined, and it's an environmental story, okay? So essentially, what, what was the plan, and they knew this with incredible discipline, as early as 99, as we're going into the new century of World Inc. They essentially concluded that what they wanted to do was create a scenario where most of the people thought that the Prius was only going to be an eco car. That what we really needed to do was to get a new generation of early adopters, and everybody was focused on this sexy new car where Gwyneth Paltrow or Leonardo DiCaprio would be driving it, okay? Well, actually, the strategy was to roll out this technology across six or seven years to all of the product family. So it's about a total revolution. And I think you know this year, um, 2007, you could spend $114,000 and buy a hybrid Lexus. Now, this was calculated already in 99 because of the rising price of oil and because Toyota was concluding that this World Inc. competition was going to be about all kinds of product options. So from the beginning, they knew that they were going to team with Honda so that it didn't appear as exclusive competition, that it was instead sisters of innovation. Then they knew that within three years, they would have a second iteration of the Prius II that was going to be so much more efficient and easier to drive. Then they understood that some of the competition would come out, like Ford would come out with the Escape hybrid. But then they wanted to move it rapidly into the quality line, the Camry, then rapidly into the SUV line, the Highlander, and then eventually into the Lexus Nexus. And I think it's very significant that last year, Toyota furthered the debate and said they're going to bring it into 10 additional models. So eventually, this is a revolution of all cars. And so recently, Thomas Friedman has written a very good op-ed where he actually said, what's wrong with Toyota that they're lobbying for no significant increases in the CAFE standards? And what I'd like to suggest is just like the Toyota, this is new century ca capitalism, just like Toyota wanted everybody to think for a while that the hybrid powertrain was just for environmental people, and then rolled out across six years something that's good for all kinds of buying segments. I'm wondering, and this is not an apology or defense, that they're saying to the American automakers, we're not going to increase CAFE for a while. Meanwhile, they're going to be doubling the efficiency of this next family of products. That is the way they think. I could tell you that is the way they think by being inside for three to four years. It's an amazing company. And so uh, I think there's an additional story that 
is worth exploring as we move on. Let me pause to see if there's any questions on that, because I know it's very much a state-of-the-art question. Ma'am? In 1999, when they um, come up with the pre strategy, what were the investment on uh, return on investment that they thought about when they developed that strategy? It does correlate with um, what I'm about to tell you. Uh, there were three concerns related to return on investment. The first concern was what percentage of market share would you need before you could predict return? Okay. And our number was only 3% sales in the hybrid powertrain of all automaking before there was some certainty of a return. Okay, so it was a threshold that they were going after. The second is when they wanted the return, they wanted to first have the certainty of regulatory relief, and so they were asking for a $3,000 tax rebate, knowing that at, at a certain point from 99 to 2004, you could pull that and it could still be a profitable car. And the third thing they wanted was to shove it very rapidly into the high-end cars like the Lexus and the Highlander, because that's where the profit margin is larger. So return on investment was one of our real concerns and one of the key questions. It's not public. I would be crucified if I talked about the actual calculation. But those are the three ways in which they calculated it. I hope that's helpful. Sir, you had a question over there? Yes. Yes. Uh, how about Honda? Uh, they started to take place. And, uh, where they go in terms of uh, uh, efficiency and you know, uh, strategies? I would need to concede that I haven't studied Honda as closely as I did Toyota, but what's significant is that looking at the scene of how many suppliers there are for the new batteries, for the way the world is going, Honda, as I understand it, has backed off. This is an example of how Toyota works towards global consolidation. They locked up the supply chain and therefore didn't need their sister's attention anymore in the innovation. Sir? You're making a good point about how quickly change takes place once the decision is made. Are you going to address what happens prior to 1999 about which technologies get chosen because of the other problems in the efficiency fields? I think I'm going to first, yes, sir. I'm first going to talk about why capitalism can get to the point of social response. And then I'm going to get to the question of what roles we should play in the S frontier. But let me first get to the why. Yes, ma'am, you have another question. Um, as you talked about, we covered travel, we covered housing, what about food? Food is a huge industry. Uh, what about food? Food is a huge industry. Uh, what about food? Where does agriculture fit into this? Where does agriculture fit into I would say that one of the reasons this book took eight years to write is because the subject is so wide that I backed off on the question of agriculture. I just could not deal with it. But it seems as if the principles are the same. If you look at Whole Foods and how Whole Foods is highly profitable right now, there seems to be a trend that's what I would describe as a World Inc. trend, where they're gaining new market share. So I'll get back to that example in a few slides. But let me underline the issues of Toyota before we move on. If you can go to the next slide, and I deliberately give you these numbers from the new century to 2004, because these were the key numbers that Toyota was looking at to verify the fact that they wanted to roll this out into the entire spectrum of products. It's a price of oil trend. That is the larger logic behind hybrids. If you turn on your TV in the morning and watch investment news, there's so much volatility connected to the price of oil, that you often get lost in the buzz rather than the trend. And what Toyota had in every single one of the weekly meetings was a sense of social history, a sense of price trends about the trend towards $3 per gallon gas, and in fact, the inevitability of it. Okay, so let me underline that I think that as you begin to think about sustainability and the sustainable enterprise, you think about connecting the dot to the price of electricity and the price of oil, because that's the sustaining force of change more than regulation. 
Let us go to the next slide so I can show you a couple of other things.